from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. I'm Jan Lauritsen. This is my colleague over here, Anne McLean. We both work in the music division here in the Library of Congress. And uh, this morning, we're um, going to talk about some very precious items from the music collections. Um, among them, two crown jewels, Cantata Number no. 9, the manuscript of Cantata Number no. 9, and Number no. 10, in box hand. They're hardly ever taken out of the vault and put on display. So all of us really are very privileged to have this opportunity to study them up close. Let's start with cantata number nine, Es ist das Heil uns kommen hier, which means salvation has come to us. The term cantata is associated with Bach because he wrote hundreds of them, mostly for Lutheran church services. Most of them date to his time in Leipzig when he was cantor of St. Thomas Church and was also in charge of music at the other main Lutheran churches in Leipzig. St. Nicholas, St. Peter, and the New Church. By the way, um, Bach was elected cantor by the Leipzig Town Council 294 years ago today, <laughs> on um, April 22nd, 1723. As cantor, it was Bach's job to prepare cantatas for every Sunday and holiday church service. which would add up to 60 plus cantatas a year. Three more or less complete full year cycles of cantatas by Bach have survived, but he may have composed as many as five, with most of the last two being lost. Bach's performances required that musicians be extremely well-trained and versatile, because Bach expected a lot of them. The town pipers and art fiddlers, including woodwind, string, and brass players, were proficient on several instruments each. They were the best musicians in Leipzig and the most well-paid. The singers were mostly students and alumni of St. Thomas School. On entry, Bach would rank the best singers as having a good voice, a fine voice, a strong voice, or a good strong voice. Having reliably fine musicians was essential to Bach, the composer. Comparing his own music to that of other composers, he said, the concerted pieces that are performed by the first choir, which are mostly of my own composition, are incomparably harder and more intricate. This is a lovely watercolor of St. Thomas Church and School where Bach and family lived, painted by Felix Mendelssohn from the vantage point of his apartment when he lived in Leipzig about 100 years after Bach. A typical Bach cantata is a multi-part polyphonic work for vocal soloists, instrumentalists, and choir with text that relates to the Bible readings in the Lutheran liturgy for a particular Sunday or holiday. Es ist das Heil uns kommen her is a chorale cantata meaning that the music incorporates the tune of a Lutheran chorale or hymn, and the text incorporates verses of the hymn, sometimes verbatim, sometimes paraphrased. Bach wrote more than 50 chorale cantatas. Es ist das Heil is based on a hymn by Paul Speratus, a Catholic priest who became a Protestant preacher and hymn writer. He and Martin Luther wrote the first Lutheran hymnal, published in 1524, known as the Octlieder Book, Book of Eight Songs. The overall subject of the hymn is justification by faith alone. Some of the text uh, can be translated as, works never help, they cannot protect us. Lord, instead of good works, you look at the strength of faith in our hearts. Only faith justifies us. The composer of the chorale tune itself is not known. It is cited as a traditional German Easter tune that dates back to around 1400. Es ist das Heil was composed sometime between 1732 and 1735 
for the sixth Sunday after Trinity, which falls in late July or early August. The cantata is in seven parts. As is typical of a chorale cantata, the first and last movements are based on the chorale, both the tune and the text, and the middle sections are recitatives and arias, which mostly paraphrase the chorale text. Here is the first of the 17 pages which comprise the manuscript. Originally, there were four folios that were folded into bifolios, resulting in four pages each. It goes like this, you know, one, two, three, four. So there are four of them. Bach added an additional page after he crossed out a messy version of the last recitative and rewrote it on a clean page. And you can see it a little bit later. Across the top, Bach wrote, J, J, Jesu, Yuva, Jesus help, Jesus help me crank out one more cantata. <laughs> Bach always wrote J, J at the beginning and Deo soli gloria, for the glory of God alone, at the very end of his music for worship. Continuing across the top, Dominica VI post Trinitatis, that's the sixth Sunday after Trinity, Es ist das Heil uns kommen hier, for four voices, one transverse flute, one haute bois, or oboe amore, two violins, viola, and continuo. I, I know it's a travesty to play little clips of a sublime piece of music by Bach, but we can't just talk about the manuscript. We have to, we have to hear the con at least some of the cantata. This is a recording by Helmut Rilling and uh, Bach Collegium Stuttgart made in um, 1985. The first clip is the beginning of the cantata, which is a kind of contrapuntal fantasy based on the chorale tune. I'll play enough of it so that you can hear the sopranos come in with the chorale tune in long, you know, sustained notes. You'll, you may recognize it. The second movement is the first of three recitatives sung by the bass. In Bach cantatas and other vocal works, um, the bass voice is often associated with God or Vox Christi. In um, this recitative, uh, God, the bass um, emphasizes God's law. So the bass will come in, um, Gott gab uns ein Gesetz, God gave us a law. The third movement is an aria sung by the tenor beginning with the words, wir waren schon zu tief gesunken, we were sunk too deep. Die tiefe drohte schon den Tod, the deep already threatened us with death. You'll note the descending somewhat tortured melodic lines that represent sinking into the depths of sin and a sort of jig-like rhythm that is a bit jaunty for the ominous text.
won't play a clip of the fourth movement, but it's again a recitative sung by the bass. Doc Musta das Gesetz erfüllt worden, but the law had to be fulfilled. The fifth movement is an absolutely elegant soprano and alto aria. Herr, du siehst statt Gatter Werke, Lord, instead of good works you look at, auf des Herzens Glaubensstarken, at the strength of faith in our hearts. It's actually a double canon pairing the flute and oboe and the soprano and alto. I'll play enough of it so that you can hear both canons. The sixth movement is a recitative again in the bass, expanding on God's law. Wenn wir die Sünd aus dem Gesetz erkennen, when we recognize sin through the law, so schlägt es das Gewissen nieder. Then conscience strikes us down. I'll move on to the seventh and last movement. It's a straightforward four-part setting of the chorale tune, which is typical. Ob sich's an Lies, Als wollt er nicht, although it seems that he is unwilling, lass dich es nicht erschrecken. Do not be dismayed. And we'll play the whole chorale. You can understand why Bach was so fond of this chorale and used it in uh, a number of cantatas. Now, how did this manuscript end up in the Library of Congress? I will read from uh, the library's annual report of 1931, where Carl Engel, then chief of the music division, gives the provenance of the manuscript. I really can't improve on what he wrote, so I'll just read it. The most signal acquisition by purchase for the year, and indeed for many years, is the original and complete holograph score of Johann Sebastian Bach's cantata, Est ist das Heil uns kommen hier. It is the first Bach manuscript of any importance that has come to the library, and there are few in America today to match it in extent and rarity. The purchase from the widow of Dr. Wolfheim the distinguished musicologist and collector in Berlin, was made possible only through a fortunate joining of forces, that is, through the gifts of money from the Friends of Music in the Library of Congress, 
and the Beethoven Association of New York combined with the resources of the library. Now I'll skip to um, the provenance. Nicholas, uh, Johann Nicholas Forkel, J.S. Bach's first biographer, wrote to an unidentified correspondent on April 4th, 1803, that at a time when Wilhelm Friedman Bach, that's Bach's oldest son, um, had been in particularly reduced circumstances, the latter had offered to him for sale an entire year of J.S. Bach's cantatas, about 69 works, in the composer's handwriting for 20 Louis d'Or. But Forkel himself, at the time, not being in sufficient funds to accept the offer, paid to Louis d'Or for the privilege of examining these manuscripts. Taking advantage of the opportunity, Forkel writes that he copied some of the finest of the cantatas belonging to the set that Friedemann had lent him. Among the cantatas copied was Es ist das Heilungs kommen hier. The whole set, according to Forkel, was sold by Friedemann before 1778 for 12 taler, that's T-H-A-L-E-R, or something like $9. With all due respect to Carl Engel, I think he may be mistaken about that or, or uh, er erred in that, because I found a table of um, the purchasing power of various currencies that were used in Germany at the time of Bach and his sons. And according to this table, 12 taler would have equaled $864, which is still a pittance for 69 Bach manuscripts. <laughs> it remains to be established who bought the holograph from Friedemann. The whereabouts of this score was unknown to Moritz Hauptmann when he prepared the publication of the cantata for the first volume of the complete Bach edition in 1851. To judge by the character of the binding and a French imprint on the shelf back of it, the manuscript must have been in French hands about the middle of the last century. The front cover has stamped on it an English title. The manuscript was acquired by the late Dr. Wolfheim some 10 years ago from the firm of Liebmannson, the musical antiquarians in Berlin, who purchased it through a private agent in 1921. Mr. Liebmannson offered the suggestion that the English owner may have been A. George Kurtz of Liverpool, whose important autograph collection was dispersed by sales in 1895 and the following years. Here is the likely provenance of the manuscript. Bach, of course, was the original owner, and when he died in 1750, it passed to Friedemann. When Bach died, um, his manuscripts and books were divided among his four musical sons and his widow, Anna Magdalena. We know that it was in the possession of Friedemann in 1773 when Forkel saw it and copied it out. We suspect that it was sold by 1778 or soon after because there is an extant letter from Friedemann to family friend Johann Joachim Eschenberg instructing him to sell all his remaining manuscripts, as Friedemann put it, convert them to cash. There is speculation that it may have been in French hands in the middle of the 19th century. At some point it was probably acquired by Andrew George Kurtz, a collector and critic in Liverpool, as suggested by the Liebmansons when they sold it to Werner Wolfheim in 1921. Wolfheim died in 1930, leaving the manuscript to his widow. The library bought it from Frau Wolfheim in 1931. I uh, located the music division's order for the purchase in 1931, which is on display. It indicates that Asip Gabrilovich, conductor of the Detroit Symphony Orchestra from uh, 1918 to 1935, made the offer of the manuscript to Carl Engel on behalf of Mrs. Wolfheim. Gabrilovich had toured and even lived in Berlin in the course of his career and must have gotten to know the Wolfheims. Gabrilovich knew Carl Engel as far back as 1917, and even, even Oscar Sonic before that. 
having made many requests to borrow or have photostats made of scores from the library's collections. We don't do that anymore. <laughs> And in 1931, he and Engel collaborated on a music festival in the Coolidge Auditorium. A few of the many letters between Gabrilovich and Engel that year mention the negotiations surrounding the manuscript. He wrote as a postscript to a letter to Carl Engel in 1931. Um, now, here is an, an entirely different story. Please read the enclosed letter from my friend and distinguished Berlin lawyer, Dr. Tickton, and please tell me whether you know of anybody who might be interested in buying the Bach manuscript which he describes. I would really appreciate your advice in this matter. And um, Gabrilovich wrote to Karl Engel again, May 5th, 1931. In accordance with our telephone conversation, I shall make an effort to ascertain, as soon as I reach Berlin, what lowest price Mrs. Wolfheim would accept for the Bach manuscript. You mentioned in your conversation the other day that other cantatas of Bach were for sale in this country at present. My request to you is only that you do not commit yourself to buy one of these other manuscripts unless, until you have heard from me, as I am almost almost sure that Mrs. Wolfheim will be most reasonable in her demands. And then, on June 2nd, uh, Gabrilovich uh, sent a telegraph to Engel, Mrs. Wolfheim, willing to sell Bach manuscript, $5,000. Please cable. Um, that wraps up my story on the manuscript of Bach Cantata number nine. Thank you for your interest. Thank you. There will be time a little later to see the items up close if you haven't seen them already, but first I'll turn the floor over to my colleague Anne McLean, who will tell you a bit about the manuscript for box cantata number 10, as well as other items um, showing different aspects of box life and work. Good morning. It's very touching to be in the presence of these magnificent scores, really, to see the physical manifestations of experiences that hold such meaning for us as music lovers. And it can be memorable to appreciate them physically and aesthetically, certainly from the point of view of handwriting and notational calligraphy, they are beautiful. Today, about 80% of Bach's manuscripts are held in the Bach archive in Leipzig. Um, and we are fortunate, as Jan says, to have these two. It's, it's remarkable, really, to see them and to hold them here at the Library of Congress. In addition to the manuscripts for these two sublime cantatas, we've also brought out for you a very small and charming manuscript of his French suites for keyboard, the very small uh, manuscript you see on this side of the table. This one is not in Bach's hand. It was copied by his son-in-law, Johann Christoph Altnikol, but it's quite significant as a major source for the suites. First, we'll take a quick look at an interesting artifact from the late 1740s that places the composer in a very earthly context. Um, earlier you saw Jan had image, that beautiful image, the wind middles and watercolor of the St. Thomas Church. Here's an image of the interior and a plaque uh, with, Bach, uh, with the flowers, as you see, in the floor. This shows the organ and gives you a sense of the space in the church, so we'll have a sense of what he would have been looking at every day when he was in there. Um, Bach's position gave him the responsibility for the music in four Leipzig churches, actually, St. Thomas, St. Nicholas, St. Matthew, and St. Peter's. He himself directed at both St. Thomas and St. Nicholas, and prefects handled the others. He also supervised the musical education of the choir boys of the Thomas School. John Elliott Gardner 
has written an extraordinary book, Music in the Castle of Heaven. And one of the things he says in there about the, uh, he has a lot about the cantatas and their, their, how they are conceived and used and so forth. He, he says he thinks one reason that Bach may have been interested in writing these is the chorale cantatas is because it would help him literally chorale and anchor the boy sopranos because it was each one, each cantata had a song that they would know, a hymn tune rather that they would know. Um, so we always think of him working with this 55 voice choir, the Tomaner Choir. Let's see a document that takes us into the realm of Bach's business life, into the mundane and quotidian round of duties he had as the Thomas Cantor. And this is something you'll see on the table there, the Natan Bequests. They are receipts in the hand of Johann Sebastian Bach, and this is why we had this title for our presentation today, In His Hand, Notes and Accounts by, by Bach. We have a page, a very small page, of Bach's handwritten receipts for payments received from the bequest um, for a wealthy lab, uh, the wife of a wealthy Leipzig cabinet maker for preparing and conducting the choir in an annual memorial service. Each year on Sabina's Day, October 26, the choir would perform funeral motets for this donor during the service at either St. Thomas or St. Nicholas. Sabine Natan, widow of this cabinet maker, died in 1612, and 134 years later, this bequest was still being honored annually. Bach was the recipient of this payment over a period of 27 years, and his, his predecessors, of course, for many years before that. This receipt is part of the library's Moldenhauer archives. It's a wide-ranging collection of more than 3,500 items documenting the history of Western music. Hans Moldenhauer was a noted alpine climber who immigrated to the U.S. in 1938, and he also wrote an important biography of Anton Webern. The library owns a major part of his collection, and you can find a, an extensive book about it online, if you like, on our website. Robert Marshall, the Bach scholar, writes that these receipts were originally bound into a big account book kept by the Cabinet Makers Guild. And as you can imagine, the ones signed by Bach were extracted and sold off over many years to collectors, like the one we have. On the recto, and you'll be able to turn it up, we'll be able to turn it over for you. On the recto are receipts for 1746 and 47. And then on the verso, uh, at the top, which is what you see here, the one for 1748. Below that, you see the handwriting is different. It's a partial receipt created by Bach's son, Johann Christoph Bach, for 1749. He started to write this for his father at age 14. And seeing this brings the poignant realization that he needed to do this because Bach was losing his eyesight. The amount of the... Um, the amount for the services rendered was five gulden, with two going to Bach and three going to the choir boys. I believe this amount, according to the Bach Documenta book, I believe this would be around 75 to 80 dollars today, probably. And Bach actually derived a lot of his income from these kinds of payments. You know, of course, as any church musician can tell you, you do weddings and funerals, and these are part of your income. He also was paid in things like candles and um, oil, heating oil, and things like that. He had an income of about 700 dollars per year, but he had all these other small sources. Um, now let's take a look at the little score I mentioned. This is a manuscript of box French suites, the cover in red goatskin. This was not the original cover. It was part of its magisterial group of keyboard works from his late 30s, including the well-tempered clavier, Goldberg variations, Italian concerto, and others. This small score is a very clear, readable copy of the French Suites, BWV 812 through 816, made by his student and son-in-law. And it measures less than eight inches wide and less than six inches high. Something that you think about when you look at this appealing little book is the platoon of excellent copyists that Bach deployed, most of them his students. He also had a private secretary, something you don't think about with Bach, for a number of years in his later year, uh, later career, although very little of his correspondence unfortunately has survived. This manuscript has, was originally thought to be a Bach manuscript uh, in his own hand, 
Philip Spitzer, the biographer, it's, it thought he could authenticate it as such, and in fact, we have a letter about that. But as you've seen this morning already in, in the calligraphy, um, this style is very different. Um, or you will see in a moment. These French suites are a little more modest in scope than the English suites, and I imagine several of you have played both those sets. How many are pianists or keyboard people? That's what I figured. These are a little shorter, sometimes described as domestic or a little lighter than the English suites and partitas. They're less contrapuntal. Um, Willem Friedemann's uh, inventions, symphonias, and well-tempered clavier, the ones written for him, I should say, were more complex. And these do not have preludes. Neither set was published in Bach's lifetime. He used these as teaching pieces, and like many of them, um, like many of his compositions, including the partitas and flute sonatas, he revised them extensively over a considerable period. Five of these suites are from 1722, from his years in Curtin, the last one probably written in Leipzig a little later. Um, according to scholars, there are at least five versions of these suites, making it hard to know what would be the definitive version. He copied them into five of them into his wife's notebook, the famous um, clavier book line of Anna Magdalena Bach, the first of two she had, and the one that he gave her shortly after they were married in 1721. So, is there something of interesting for a queer, that's interesting for a quick look? One thing is that the title page does not say French suites. It actually says six suites, and then and below that, a description of the dance forms in German, similar to the title page you see on his partitas. The French title that we see on modern scores came much later, 12 years after Bach's death, from Friedrich Wilhelm Marburg, and also uh, his biographer, Forkel. Our manuscript, copied after 1744, is the last chronologically of the major sources for the French suites, and there were many sources. Often performers choose to collate their own performing edition, and that's what Richard Egar did, who was here just a few weeks back in January. A lot of artists go back to the source and look at the manuscripts themselves and collate and choose and put together an edition which they, they like. Um, our score, the, the point of showing this today is that our score is important for Bach scholarship because it includes all six suites and it is written, it is copied in what is today considered the correct order. This score was one of the sources for the complete Bach edition. So how French are they? In fact, not so very. Many commentators talk about the steel gallant aspects and French inflected melodies and so on, but when you look at the individual suites, you see both Italian and French style courant movements and quite an international variety of instrumental dance forms, including a Polish one, the Lure, you can see the name up at the top at the left, and also an Anglaise, which I believe is a form unique to this source uh, for Bach, his only use of it, I, I believe. He wrote these at Curtin, a princely court, where he was definitely exposed to all kinds of dance movements and musical conventions from the continent and elsewhere. When you look at this display later, this volume is open to the saraband movement of the fifth suite, and it's a rare chance to see Bach's own ornamentation. Generally, in terms of ornaments, there are very few indicated in any of his scores. The thinking player, a sophisticated musician, would have created his own ornaments, of course, according to the taste and style of the day and his own instincts. Bach would have been surprised to see modern editions with many ornaments carefully indicated. There's one other rather esoteric point that's fun to make, or interesting to make, based on this particular Bach source. I looked at Ruth Tatlow's book, God's Numbers, which makes an interesting and strong case for Bach using revisions, even revisions to what are essentially finished manuscripts, to bring his works into the realm of symbolism. She calls her theory proportional parallelism, basing it on concepts about proportions of universal harmony, physical, moral, and philosophical harmony that reflected God's creation. And she believes that he tinkered carefully with final copies of his work to bring them into line with mathematical concepts of proportion. Quote, probably Altnikol's version has been numerically revised in pursuit of numerical perception. That's our copy. 
Her book has a number of charts, including one that shows a total count of 1,380 written bars for this manuscript in support of her theory, which reflects divine design. Interesting, so maybe you might like to check it out. Now let's turn to the cantata, Meine Seele erhebt den Herren, My Soul Doth Magnify the Lord. This cantata is for the Feast of the Visitation of Mary, performed for the first time on July 2nd, 1724, probably not performed again until seven, and after 1740. The German text is based on the story of the visitation of the Virgin Mary to her cousin Elizabeth and the prefiguring of the birth of Christ. Bach's chorale cantatas were written on texts composed by librettists generally, and these actually had to be reviewed and approved by senior clerics in the Lutheran church before he could set them, before he was able to go ahead and do it. That's a new fact for me, again, from this fascinating book. But for this cantata, the opening chorus is taken from Luke 1, verses 46, 48, which are familiar to many people. Oh, how my soul praises the Lord, how my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. The fifth movement uses the verse 54, he has helped his servant Israel and remembered to be merciful. This cantata does not have a traditional chorale or hymn tune from the Lutheran church as its musical foundation. It uses the German Magnificat that you hear in the Vespers liturgy. It seems to resemble a reciting tone and it carries a melodic hint of connections to chant and to modal harmony that give it an archaic character, a slightly archaic character. The cantata has several, seven movements with an overall tonality of G major, sorry, G minor. In the opening chorus, which we'll hear in just a moment, you'll hear the cantos formas, the foundational melody, first in the sopranos and then in the altos. I wanted to show you this blank page, the second of the page of the manuscript, because it shows you that Bach made his own score, and probably uh, everyone did in those days. Manuscript paper was very expensive. He had a rostrum, which is those fork-like implements that you draw across the page, and uh, apparently used some of them until they were worn out. You can see their, their spaces, and they're not, sometimes they're not even any equal, you know, the lines are not equal. But um, he, he worked, he made his own uh, scores, and he had three types of ink, which we'll talk about in a, in a moment. Um, there, as I say, there's seven movements, a chorus, Meine Seele erhebt in Herend, soprano aria, tenor recitative and a bass aria, a duet, a beautiful duet, which has the full chorale melody, we'll hear it in a moment, um, pointed out by the trumpet a uh, tenor recitative and a final chorus, which uses also a bit of the, doc uses the doxology in the end. So Mike, let's play this opening chorus just for a moment. You'll hear the trumpet right away. Written, this is written for soprano, alto, tenor, and bass soloists in SATB chorus with an accompanying ensemble of trumpet, two oboes, two violins, viola, and continuo. And the trumpet, which you heard, is very appropriate for this cantata because during the Baroque period it was associated with the concept of divine majesty. 
The parts for this manuscript score are held in the Leipzig Bach archive. Parts and scores were often separated by the family after his death with the thinking that the works themselves might be better preserved than if they were kept everything by one party. Masaki Suzuki made the point to us when he looked at this score with us that he felt one could learn much more from the parts than from the score. Scores, as we can see with this one, have very few markings for tempi. Um, very few for articulation, and in fact, they are, they're rather bare bones compared to what you see in the parts in terms of bowings and things like that. Um, here, in fact, for our score, the instrumentation is not even notated, notated on the score proper. It's in the wrapper of the folios surrounding the music. Um, I wanted to mention that this score is now available, actually both cantatas are now available in very handsome reproductions from Laber Verlag, um, both with an excellent preface by our former colleague, Dan Boomhauer. Um, before moving on, Mike, let's hear a bit of the duet of the alto and tenor. It's, it's a beautiful piece and it, the way the chorale is treated, melody is treated, is very nice. Er denke der Barmherzigkeit. Before looking uh, at a couple of details from the manuscript, which are really instructive, let's look at the provenance for a moment. Gertrude Clark Woodall, who donated this pavilion and the strads, which you, Stradivari instruments, which you see here, um, gave the funds to make this purchase. So this manuscript is now part of the Woodall Foundation collection. It's been owned by a fascinating group of notable owners, including first Wilhelm Friedemann Bach, then Philipp Spitta, the 19th century Bach biographer. His work was very significant for its time and in fact was almost unbudgeable for generations afterwards, um, even though his information was often later not proved so reliable. Karl Pistor, an inventor and collector, bought the manuscript and gave it to his daughter Betty, who was a friend of Felix Mendelssohn's. And later, the mining magnate Karl Wittgenstein, the father of the philosopher Ludwig Wittgenstein, um, and his son, uh, Paul, was a pianist who was known for having created a significant repertoire for piano left hand. You may have heard about him. He lost his arm during the First World War. And... Um, uh, Ravel and Strauss and a number of people wrote works for him. He continued to tour as a pianist um, for quite a number of years. He immigrated to the U.S. in the late 1930s and he brought some family valuables with him, including a number of music manuscripts which remained in this country. <clears throat> His sister, Margareta, married an American psychiatrist named Jerome Stoneborough, who was a colleague of Freud's uh, and lived in Vienna for a long time. It was her son, John H. Stoneborough, who sold our manuspect to a former music division chief, Harold Spivak, in 1948. So it's a, it's a colorful history when you read about it. It's rather sad. The family was just estranged from each other, and um, the man, there was some acrimony over the manuscripts, but this is how it, it came to the Library of Congress. So regarding this 
manuscript. There, it tells us a lot of things uh, that it's really fun to look at, and we'll just have time to look at them quickly here, a few items. Bach, as we know, was incredibly industrious and very meticulous, and he worked very quickly. In a composing score, like the two cantata manuscripts we have, you see he sometimes works with just soprano and bass and fills in later. Sometimes he completes the full score, pressing on, and sometimes even continuing in mid-thought. The sheer volume of his tremendous output meant that he was always writing under pressure, and we've talked a little bit about how many works he was doing. Um, at one point, I think in 1723, he had something like nine works completed and to be done in 16 days for a big Christmas celebration. And he revised his work constantly. This is something that you will read about in many studies, box studies. Um, Within a composition, he revised them. While working, he revised them. And then when revisiting them, he made constant revisions, sometimes much later. Throughout his life, this was a practice. And also, as we know, borrowing from himself and repurposing material from one work to another or to several works. On this page that we're looking at, see the part in tiny writing at the very bottom? There are three empty, four empty staves, and then you see he's sort of sketched out something a little faintly, a little less, little less um, hard in terms of bearing down on the ink, uh, and the pen rather. This is, he's thinking and revising um, at the same time. He wrote in this phrase as a kind of an aide memoir to hold his musical thought while the ink dried, um, like a little to-do note for himself. But he was also revising, certainly, because when you look at the next page, you can also see, you see up here in the middle of the page, near where, the, where it says page two and revisions, you can see that he has continued that thought with those phrases, but they're a little different already by the time he had turned the page. And a lot of people talk about this because um, he apparently worked at a desk with three types of ink, black, sepia, and um, a powder that he would uh, uh, stir water together with a copper gallic powder. He made his own ink. Anyway, he had an inkwell there and he would have to wait until the ink had dried before he could go on. And sometimes this process would take maybe five to six minutes, they say. Um, there was a box of sand on his desk, very fine sand, that he would have sprinkled over heavy ink passages to make them dry faster. But nonetheless, it took a while for this to happen. So what you'll find when you look at these manuscripts is that he did indeed change a few things when he uh, continued, even on a, one page later. So let's see, this is the um, page two of, or sorry, this is the soprano aria. And at the bottom, you see there are three um, crossed out staves. This is another section where he was sort of working out his thoughts. Um, and he actually, the same thing, when you have the chance to go further, you'll, you'll actually see um, that what he has begun here is not quite exactly what you would expect. It's a little different. Um, the next page, this one is interesting because it shows how he used the manuscript pages of space that he had available to him. Meaning, um, you see in the middle, there are these kind of little, um, I don't know what you, tadpole-like figures, upside down tadpoles. He just kind of made little notations to himself. He didn't write it all out. But he's backing this up against other parts of the piece. And he's just basically, you know, continuing right along. He knows what he has in mind and so forth. So these kinds of usages of, of joining sections together, economizing on paper, um, and barreling through in a way to get his ideas onto the paper, these are all very indicative of his style. 
We find it astonishing today the number of what are considered masterpieces that he created on a steady schedule for the yearly church calendar, some 300 cantatas, um, plus, of course, the many larger works. Actually, it was common for cantors to write annual cycles of 60 works, and I read that Telemann wrote more than 1,700 and Graupner more than 1,400, both of whom were offered the Leipzig position before Bach, actually. But the level of writing and musical thinking, uh, the mastery of these works is at a far higher level. So let's hear the final chorale with the doxology, and then we'll just have a moment of, about the ink. Um, so, yeah, this is the chorale page. <laughs> So a word about the, the pres preservation of the manuscripts and about the ink. He used something called iron gall ink, often in this kind of an aubergine color. It, it has come to that color today. Um, it's a heavy ink with a lot of tannin, an oak substance from those oak balls that you see, and uh, lots of minerals, a combination that today is unfortunately rather deleterious to the health of these manuscripts. And we know that many, many of them are deteriorating at the Bach Archive, too. If you know any Silicon Valley tech moguls who would like to underwrite preservation of Bach manuscripts, it would be an extraordinary gesture to, to try and find a way to preserve them. But you can see here at the top and elsewhere where the ink is concentrated and blobs are. Um, when you pick up the ink to write, the minerals, apparently, the heavier minerals dripped off onto the paper, so they cause some of the blobs. Today, those blobs are literally eating away the manuscripts. Fortunately, here at the library, we have expert conservators in our conservation department who are uh, have been able to work with these manuscripts. As you see, they are handsomely preserved, and they've done a number of things to them. For example, bathing them in a warm bath of calcium, magnesium, magnate, uh, yeah, magnesium, and putting rice starch into the binding and so on. If they were not preserved in the mylar, they probably couldn't really be viewed. And other museums and um, libraries sometimes put them under glass. But we're lucky that we have these, that you can actually turn the pages. And I encourage you very much to do that um, when you're looking at them. It's a privilege to have these in our collections and a privilege to show them to you today. And uh, makes, seeing them with you makes me think of a quote that I found from a man named Otto Bettmann. Box music sets in order what life cannot. So please come up and take a look. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.